Happy, beautiful day. It's Pete Cohen. This is the My365 podcast. Today's podcast is called The Stance of Your Heart, where I interview the awesome Sarah Moxham. Sarah is a business leader, entrepreneur, podcaster, and one of my dearest friends. And in the podcast, we really dive into the subject of death and grief. Sarah lost her sister recently, and she also lost one of her best friends, my wife, who also passed away not too long ago. Death is still a big taboo for many people in terms of just talking about it. And in the podcast, we discuss how we have dealt with the tragic loss of people that are really important uh, to us. This is a very inspiring and moving podcast, and I'm delighted to be able to share this with you. So enjoy, and I'll see you after the theme tune. The greater things that are stuck inside my head. The greater things that are stuck inside my head. Okay, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me on, Pete. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah, really well. I'm tempted to ask, tell us a little bit about yourself first or tell us how you've been dealing with what's, tell us what's happened to you. Say whatever you want, basically. So... What's on on your mind hmm. right now? It's funny, actually, because until today, I hadn't felt sad all week, but this morning I did, and I guess knowing what we were going to talk about, knowing what we've both been through, and just tapping into my heart. So my sister passed away in April, on April the 4th, of um, a brain... Well, what cancer which had started in the breast, and it started when she was... Well, we found out when she was six months pregnant that she had stage three breast cancer, and she gave birth in September to my beautiful nephew, River, and then in December, we found out that it had spread to the brain lining and she passed away on April the 4th. Um, so, yeah, still quite fresh being... Where are we now? July. July 1st. There you go. So how long ago was that? So, what, three months? Three months. Three months. Yeah, I mean, we might need some tissues. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, there's so much... I think what's fascinating on so many levels, first off, obviously, your sister was called Hannah... Yes. And which was obviously the name of my wife, Hannah, who was a good friend of yours. Um, But I think what really amazed me about you was how you leaned into what was, you leaned into that, which I'd love to Mm. ask you how, how you decided to deal with this when it was happening to your sister. But then what amazed me about you was how you leaned into Hannah. It must have been really raw because your sister had passed away and then you came and saw Hannah, and then you came and saw Hannah again in the hospice, and I was like, how are you, how are you doing this? Have you not experienced enough of this to make you go, I, I don't want to deal with this? Mm. What, what made you do decide to come and see Hannah after what you must have been going through, or still going through? Yeah, I've thought about this question this morning, actually. Not knowing who you were going to ask it, but just asking myself how, and... What was what what was I thinking? What was I going through? And the truth is I wasn't thinking. It's it was just a movement of of course. There wasn't a question about it. It was like, of course I'm gonna be there. There isn't a there wasn't a set there wasn't another choice. You know, for me it was a of course I'm gonna be there. And I love the words that I've heard you use lots of times, which is leaning in. And I remember saying to one of my friends, you know, because when everything happened with Hannah, my sister it was tragic and it is tragic and it was devastating and devastating for so many people on so many levels because it really, she was 31 and I think it brought about the fragility of life in so many ways for so many people because she was healthy, she was fit, she ate well, there was no signs, there was nothing. Obviously she was pregnant, her first child, happily married in love for like 13 years like amazing partnership one that everyone kind of admired at what they'd created and so the devastation was a lot for a lot of people and um being in that situation and having 
a lot of people to answer to as well. My parents were and are pillars in their community and I'm the oldest of the three of us. So I took it on to do a lot of that contact with people, which was a lot. And um, how did I feel supported in that time? It was from the people that lent in. And it wasn't about the words that people knew what to say or the fact that people could be there physically, because obviously not everyone can by situation. But it's a position of the heart that you know when someone is with you, you Mm. know? Yeah, that's a really profound position of the heart. Position of the heart. (laughs) Because I wish I'd been there for you more. But you were. See, I remember, Pete, you were. So I remember calling you when Hannah first had her diagnosis. And, you know, our Hannah's both chose different types of treatment. And... Um, I knew the success that you'd had with your with your Hannah. Let's call it your yeah, Hannah. Yeah. And the years that you'd got her through who you'd been and, and the questions that you'd asked and the way that you'd sought answers. And my sister and husband and her husband chose not to take that path. They went, you know, down the path of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and um, stuck to the, the NHS instructions and didn't change didn't change a diet that wasn't their choices um and that for me it brought up a lot you know and you were amazing at helping me processing that in that time and I remember having that call with you and you I was I was actually yeah in here, I remember and the questions you told me to ask myself and the the you know I remember you helped me just to focus on my nephew you were like who do you want to be for your nephew yeah. and um you know what questions do you want to ask your sister and you really helped me in that time so it just felt like a natural overflow. Not that it was a transactional at all, but it was like, and of course I'm there well, for you. <laughs> thank you. I think maybe there's this thing when these types of situations happen, I don't know whether I'm the only one, you feel like you always could have done more. Mm. When I, I, I think that about Hannah, I, because this has been the biggest stop of my life, even though yeah. I haven't actually stopped, but it's been the biggest wake-up call of my entire life. <laughs> And now as I look back, I think I wish I'd made more of the time that we had. But I also feel extremely grateful for the mm-hmm. time that we had. I'm just curious. You what, know. What, what about, so you used the word wake-up call. What was the wake-up call for you? What was the shift, if, that, if they call it a shift? Um, well, that's a massive question. I think it's the fact that it had been so traumatic for the last probably 16 months with, with Hannah. Mm-hmm. It had been literally just a a treadmill of being re-diagnosed, not being able to go back to America for the treatment that she had all those years ago because of choices that we made around vaccination, which is maybe a conversation for another day. (laughs) Um, So we couldn't go back there. Um, So I almost gave up. I honestly almost thought, well, there's nothing we can do. And it was actually someone else we know, it was Dr. Bob, Mm -hmm. who was like, you can't, you can't you've got to keep going and honestly I if it wasn't for him you know yeah so um we literally we went to that whole thing of going to Germany and having all of that treatment it was just going backwards and forwards to Düsseldorf to Munich coming back here to scans and then thinking because she had she had amazing results right she had four tumors then it was three then there was one and it was getting smaller and we thought this is a miracle and then she got COVID and just that whole treadmill and then it stopped. Yeah. And then obviously the, the, the dying phase, it had to stop. Everything just stopped. You know, I couldn't carry on. I, there's no way I could carry no. on. Like as if nothing had happened. It was the first time in my life I actually had to stop because mm. I didn't have the ability to concentrate or to focus. And I think you went through yeah. something quite similar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was... Which must have been quite difficult for you because you're a very, very successful, highly driven leader, you know, super successful in my eyes. Yeah. But was it similar for you? Like, oh, my God, I just have to stop. Yes. And there were so many moments of that. So at the time of my sister's diagnosis, I was living in Ibiza. I was exploring the market out there, exploring potentially living out there a bit more long term. Um, and we got the the news in July and I can remember um, I was actually in Barcelona at the time and I di- it didn't quite sink in because my sister and her husband were very 
definite about wanting to create a certain environment around Hannah in her house. And that was one of immense positivity. So probably much like yourself, my brother-in-law shouldered a lot of the knowing of what the diagnosis actually meant. And he asked us once it spread to the brain lining not to actually Google it. So none of us actually knew the life expectancy of people who, who had gone through that you know by medical records and and, and that sort mm. of stuff so yes because it it changed my whole life in terms of coming back home and then when my nephew was born and holding my nephew I had this intuitive just wave come over me of like you are going to be a massive part in raising this little boy's masculinity and like being a part of shaping who he is and um, well, I so just you wept. had that awareness you yeah. Picked up, like, yes you so realized. many moments there was so much awareness that would come through that slowly made me come back. I would say come back home into self and just know what your do you own mean, values. Come back home. What? So, like, fa- okay, so family's always been super important to me, but I haven't necessarily because of building businesses, creating success in the, in that way. Um, that took time, energy, and effort. So I wouldn't necessarily have always spent every single weekend with them or been overzealous at being present at absolutely every single thing because I my priorities were building the company or being there for whatever it was I needed to be there for but I, I could feel that shift immediately it was like you need to be you are here this is a yeah. shift in your season this is a shift in your timing um a real heart to actually have my own family birthed and watching the union that my brother-in-law and my sister had and you know I admire in, the, in exactly the same way an absolute admiration of yours and Hannah's love like that's love that's the real deal it's like can you give your life for another (laughs) can you that's love you know can you actually stop and can you stop and give what you've given to Hannah for as many years I say it's funny I mean it's highly emotional but um, um, the love I saw you give your sister yeah. You know, it's the same thing, right? You yeah. just literally... And the love you because gave... everything. You stop... Every, all of you goes into that, you know? Everything. I think that's um, the same in... Um, what you did for Hannah. It's the same thing, the way you just, like... You 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 leaned in, and I've just... I mean, I've, I felt like I've always known who you are. Yeah. Because I think we're quite similar. If someone said, "Who's Sarah?" I could tell. I could tell everyone who Sarah is. Yeah. She's a force of nature. She's <laughs> she's hilarious. She's amazing. She's incredible. But it didn't surprise me that you you behaved in the way that you behaved. With with uh, behavior is the wrong word. The way you responded. The way you yeah. acted. It's just love. Just yeah. Um, but it still made me just see just your greatness that you could you could do that because I think a lot of people would struggle to do what you did they would run away from from the situation that you're in but you didn't yeah and I think thank you thank you for everything you said then thank you for always being my biggest cheerleader I speak I am. about you all the time <laughs> in those days like we were just talking about it before weren't we how many years is it like 10 years ago you always you've always had an ability to see greatness in everybody but you actually spent time calling it out of me coaching that out of me you know. I didn't do very much but you, did you didn't need speaking, very much but with the speaking you did you really I remember the first time I saw I never forget when I saw you speak at that Wembley, event at Wembley yeah. and I remember just I remember sitting going I can't believe this is you because I just saw another side of you that was already there. Well, what is that, do you think? Because I felt like I just saw the essence of who you are, which is this... I, I don't even know if there are words to describe it, but what was happening when you were speaking at that event, do you think? Yeah. Mm. Thanks for asking that. I think it's... You tap into part that you don't quite know is there until you're there, yeah. you know? Um so someone can coach that or teach you how to speak or do whatever, but that was speaking from the heart. It was speaking from like a, a, a different place, you know, that day. Um, and I think that's what with the, the the phrase that you used just before about your heart position stance, of the, heart, the position yeah. of your of your heart. I think you always know when someone's yes. coming from the heart. And you know, you know when someone, you can even when you read a message in that yeah. time of grief, you can feel you're like that person's with me 
or that person doesn't have capacity. They don't know what to do with it. I don't know if you found that. I did. I was thinking about that today. But it's like, oh, what do you do? What have you done with that? What have you done with, can, can you, yeah. How have you dealt with those situations? I was looking at some messages I sent today to some people and I thought, I could feel how I felt when I wrote them. And and I thought, I I wish I'd said something, you know, wish I'd come from a different place. So how has this all changed you? Because, I mean, Mm. part of what I wanted to talk to you about was leaning in and and death. Why why we don't talk about Mm. this thing which is inevitable and I would love to change some of the narrative around it. How has this changed you? How are you different now? Yeah. I think it's interesting what you say about how we don't talk about it because if you look at eastern philosophy they do yeah they really do you know and you look at other cultures and how they celebrate death and how they welcome death and it's definitely part of life and life and death are seen completely different so i think it's a western yeah western perspective that we don't um and how has it changed me I, it's still changing me you know i think um you don't lose somebody who's so close to you so quickly and so tragically and it not consistently change you um and immediately I think you I went through this and I know we saw each other when it was so fresh and I went through a very mystical and raw time it was deeply feeling for me it was and it was energy and what I could feel I knew I knew she was going to pass before she passed and I did a lot of work with an energy healer immediately that, that that was who I was drawn to and that was the kind of methodology that I chose to initially heal but how has it transformed me I think um as I said like this deep desire to um have a family of my own is a is one of the areas and and cultivate and and develop that deep union that her and my brother-in-law had um also just it gets things in perspective you just you're like, why was I worrying about that thing? Or like, you know, why did I give that person all that time, energy or or thought or worry or, you know, so it changes your just little perspectives. Um, Relationally, I have found just such gratitude for my friends and the tribe that I built around me and the tribe that supported me. And um, that will carry us forever you know the people that really lent in and were there so in a deep sense of relationships and and what that means um I think we spoke about this and with work it didn't so much change my perspective um on what I wanted to do in action um I guess it just gave it deeper meaning like I found a lot more meaning and a lot more like okay you're here to live on purpose you're here and that purpose piece just deepened um an impact piece deepened and what is that purpose oh that's it's so layered um i think if i just give it an overarching thing for me i'm i'm about creating a world of freedom and choices for others and a world where truly everyone is free Mm. and i know that's such a broad kind of vision but that plays out in so many different ways in the businesses that I build that provide financial freedom for people, the human rights and women's right activism work that I do, the coaching that I do. Freedom comes in so many layers. It's, you know, one of the one of the um, charities that I'm partnered with is, is actually about it, human trafficking. So we're talking about the freedom of lives and being out of slavery. But then you've also got freedom of, psych, you know, our psychology and our makeup and things that have held us back in our belief system. So there's so many ways that yeah. freedom can play out. But what about you? How? Um... I think it's a, coming from the heart thing is mm. where it's all about for me. But the service thing, like yeah. you, I, I just want to, this whole thing is this the, being the biggest stop of my life where everything is different. Nothing mm. seems the same. Um, and I feel like now I have this opportunity to really learn more from what Hannah was about because Mm. Hannah was ridiculously intentional. Mm. I mean, like with her work, you can, you know, when you're making quilts, you have to be like, and she was kind and loving enough to not question me too much, but she would often be saying, you know, why are you doing that? Like, for example, how we met, we met through the Organo uh, business, mm. and I would bring people into the business, and she'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. "You met some of these people." Oh, I loved her for that. And then she was like, "What are you doing?" 
yes. this person really is not someone you want to work with. But I desperately wanted to make it work. So I, I put my focus of attention to every, everybody. everywhere. I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty good judge of character, but I'd lose that judgment when I'm coming out of a place of almost desperation or just coming out of excite, excited energy rather than actually stopping and taking a bit of a moment to think about, well, if I do yes. this. And she was just amazing at that. She really was. And I can remember like so many moments where she brought that intentionality to me. And it would be, she was a woman of few words, but her words were so poignant and so well thought out that they always had the biggest impact. Mm. You'd always go, that was what I needed to hear. But she'd do it in love and gentleness and grace and kindness and humour as yeah. well. Lots of humour. But she was so intentional and she didn't need to be the loudest in the room. Hannah was never the loudest in the room. We did that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Between us, we caused all the chaos. And um, she really was our, our grounding and our reason in in our in our craziness. Yeah. What, what did you love most about Hannah? Oh, so much. I loved the the picture that always comes to my mind's eye, or it's often come to my mind's eye when I've sat with her passing, um, is that one when we were in Vegas and I got my sapphire or oh Ghana. Yeah, Do you, you remember got, that? We got the given award. an award. There's that big eagle. That big eagle that we got. And I came off stage and we wept together with like joyful happiness and just knowing the process that we'd gone through and she just cried with me. That wasn't her reward, that wasn't her moment, but we shared that moment together. Mm. And there was a picture where we've both got like tears running down our face, but we're smiling. Yeah. We're like literally we've got the most beaming smiles. Because and there was something about the two of you that yeah. you can't really put it. She had it with a few people. Yeah. She didn't she didn't have it with too many females. She had like just this deep, deep connection. Did you meet Ian? I don't know whether you ever I met, meet Ian. Ian Phillips. Yeah. yeah. Who also had a brain tumor. She oh, had was it that with his him. funeral with you in Wales, yeah. Oh my god. I remember. Yeah. But you had that relationship with her. We could just look at each other across the room and we just knew each other. And I always remember whenever I had a picture, like, I love to laugh and I have a really cackly laugh. And whenever I, uh, someone would catch a picture of me laughing, I'd always send it to her because yeah. she'd love it. And it yeah. would just be this knowing. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, I've still got her phone and I haven't gone through her WhatsApp messages with, that you had with her. Yeah. But I remember her showing me some of those pictures that you sent her yeah. of you laughing. Because she really... She really loved you. Yeah. You know, she really kind I of... really loved her. Yeah. Yeah. Was, um, and I think the, one of the hardest things was when she was passing, because she didn't say much, but when she wanted to speak, it was because she wanted to ha She wanted to say something. And myself and Jerry, who's in the room while we're recording this podcast, it was really hard because she wanted to, to speak. What, what do you think? <laughs> We've got... It's funny because I say funny, maybe funny is the wrong word. We've got Jerry in the room and we've got Wes in the room as well. And Wes filmed some testimonials of speaking because I asked at Hannah's funeral for people to speak. And, you know, he said how difficult and challenging that was, but it, it was something that had to be done. What do you think Hannah would think of Jerry knowing that now Jerry wants to become, as he told you, he yeah, wants to become bereavement a, a bereavement yeah. counsellor? What what do you think Hannah would think do of that? It. Amazing. Yeah. She was everyone's biggest cheerleader. I, I think she wasn't everyone. She was that, a big yeah, she was a okay. cheerleader of the people that she loved. That's also true. Yeah. That is also true. <laughs> what I loved about Hannah was she spoke her mind. Yeah. She and she spoke it. She she was yeah, it was almost like it's just how it is. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So I wanna ask you about a few things which are quite deep, but I'm just curious about um, what do you think happens when people pass? Oh, what a good question. Because everyone, lots of people have different ideas about this. What, 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 do you think... So I was brought up in a Christian household, so the concept of heaven and hell 
like as an actual tangible, you know, good and bad was one that I was born with. But I don't, I don't find resonance internally in in that. Like, do I believe in reincarnation or I don't know, but I do believe that you don't go. Yeah. So I do believe in that. And I, I know from an energy and feeling perspective, I can feel even people that have passed or connect with them. Um, so that means to me that they can't go. It's not a memory. Yeah. It's, it's something different to a memory. I don't think we could just, dis- I don't think we disappear. Yeah, I think maybe What's that's, uh, no, I would say very, very much the same. Mm. That I, it's not like I need to know everything. No. But I definitely have a feeling of she's still here. Yeah. Um, in fact, some people who are very close to her, because you've dreamt about Hannah, right? I have. Yeah. I even remember, do you remember about a day, it was a day or two before she passed. And I remember I, I dreamt, she said, this is the last text message I'm going to send you. I love you. Yeah. And that was the dream and I told you, didn't yeah. I? And Because um, some people yeah. I know, I, I haven't had that level of, I've seen her in a dream and she's about in her th- early 30s. She looks like Olivia and Newton-John in Greece. You remember you've seen yes. Greece? You know when she, when at, that, at the end when she comes on and she's ridiculously sexy and yeah. smoking. Not that Hannah's smoking, but <laughs> I, that's how I see her jumping around, yeah. wavy blonde hair. That's how I see her in my mind. Um, and I feel her around me, but I suppose it's just that sadness of... I, I, I'm curious as to how are you dealing... Is that something mm. you're... Because the last few days have, I found yeah. really really difficult just yeah waves a lot of people talk about the stages of grief yeah which i'm not i haven't connected with the stages of grief i yeah. read that no i haven't i didn't i'm not saying I, I just no haven't. no no i didn't it didn't resonate for me um i dream about my sister often i dream psychically or intuitively um it's a strong sense for me so she comes to me and there are me- there are messages that will come through um, what are there messages that you hear, or just a sense? Or? Like it's either a sense, or there's a, a narrative, and it's about to play out, or something that's happening. Just to be like, oh, just be aware of this, or hey, let me so just like show you this thing. So like someone looking out for you. Yeah, yeah, massively so. And it was very for me when she passed. I could I remember describing it to the the healer that I was seeing at the time as like. I could feel her in me and I could... And it was very... It's like I wouldn't let her go. And part of that first session was actually energetically letting her go and I could physically feel her leave. I was... Yeah. Where parts of her, I was... You know, the healer described it as I was trying to hold on to her soul. Um, and I, I could Do you think that's part of not that. letting go? Yes. This was before the funeral. This was very, very raw. Do you think that's why a lot of times maybe people struggle with loss because they don't want to let go yeah well i mean again to use the words of the healer she said you know actually when she when you see her go into the crematorium actually let her go because so many people still hold on and her belief system was that you actually still hold on to part of that person's soul and you don't allow them to transition properly um you know whether or not i don't think i've let hannah go yeah I don't think I have, just just because it's almost like not wanting to let go. Because yeah. it's like, well, who would I be? Yes. If I if I let a her go, void there. Because what yeah. I found was when I did let her go, inside I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this? What is this gap? There's a massive hole. That's just what it felt like. For and you have to sit. For me, I had to sit with the hole and not feel the hole and feel everything that that hole. And it's horrible. Horrific. Why is it horrible? Because it's empty. It's yeah. really empty. And um, so, what do you do with that hole? Th- this empty hole. You feel s- it. Yeah. <laughs> Be with it. Spend time with it. You know, for me, that looks like I I've, I like to take the mornings. I wake up very early, as I know you do, and I'll put on some of the music that she loved or sitting in a space of meditation and quietness and just feel that pain 
Yeah. But it doesn't stay as pain, but yeah. there is pain there. Do you think this is very cathartic by yeah. the way, for me? <laughs> because you know, it's 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 great to speak with to people that are going through something similar. Do you think when you were saying that, I was thinking that's something I've been doing, but I could do it more mm. intentionally because I've just kind of been playing around with the idea as opposed to no, I'm going to really allow myself to feel this. In fact, Wes, who we refer to again, who's uh, filming this, he um, came back here after the funeral mm. and he played this music in the background and we started talking about contemplating. Mm. And it was like the first time I'd kind of stopped because the funeral was and organizing all of it and all that sort of stuff you know was active yeah and there was like a stop yeah and to be in that space i don't know why why is it scary why is that space scary what is it about that space i think i mean i, d I don't know the answer to that, but what comes to me now is we're not used to being there yeah. So again, let's come back to like the Western world. We're yeah. especially in, in in the UK in the type of environment we're doing, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing, and it's so easy to go into doing. And I mean, for some people, that may be their process of healing, and and that may be how they then move forward. Um, I have gone back into building the business and have gone back into being with my team and. I will make sure I'm intentional also sitting with the space and being with the void and yeah. So, you know, the thing that comes to mind to me about the void is the void is home. Yeah. It's like, it's where we're from and where we're going. Yeah. That's, how my, that's my interpretation of it. Yeah. And we're frightened of that, which is frightened of the place we came. Well, you know what? There's actually a stoic principle, which is to contemplate your own death. Yeah. And they take yeah, you this, through a series of meditations. Yeah on being at, at like coming through to the sort of being at yeah. your death and go through, and I not have friends who I remember one one of my friends was telling me she actually lost her mother a few weeks before I lost lost Hannah and she said that she found mm. the process okay because she'd actually done all this work in lockdown she's like hours and hours of contemplating everyone's death and she'd actually taken time out to do it's that. called memento more which right. is what the stoics used to whisper into Marcus Aurelius's ear when he was because he was one of the Caesars yeah uh, emperors sorry and um they would whisper into his ear memento mori remember you're going to die yeah. remember this is all this is never going to last this is just to make the most of it yeah and it is an interesting thing to contemplate death because I suppose I suppose the thing about Hannah because we want to we're going to make a film about all of this and her life and we want there to be a few kind of key messages. And I suppose one of them is legacy. What do you want to leave behind? Mm -hmm. Because Hannah died when she was 38. And we hear what people say about her. I think you, did you, did you speak? I don't know. I didn't do a recording in the end, right. so I must. <laughs> well, you can do it now. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, how do you want to be remembered? Mm. What do you want to leave behind? And I think even though she lived a short life in some people's eyes, the impact that she had on so many people. I mean, just think about how how much more richer our lives are mm. because of her. I mean, mm. it's like, and your sister. I mean, it's yeah. like, you couldn't buy that. You couldn't go to university and study that. It's like, you've. I, the way I look at it is, Hannah has given me something mm -hmm. and I can do something with that or I could not. Mm -hmm. It's my choice. And, you know, I choose... <laughs> Even though it's difficult, I, I do find it hard, but I definitely am choosing for my life to be better and to serve other people better. Yeah. And to do her proud. I want to do her proud. I want yeah. to, I want her life to m carry on through me. Yeah, I hear that. And I really connect with that through my nephew. So, yeah, like, wow. I have literally looked at this little boy and continue to and make different life choices because of him. Or not different, but, like, I'm more conscious, I'm more thoughtful, I'm more intentional about yeah. those life choices, about, you know, everything, the words I use, the things I say, the, the, it, it changes everything, because he is her legacy as well. Yeah. And that, you know, um, it's the next generation, service of the next, service of what's coming. 
Well, I'm, I really appreciate you, you saying that again, because obviously Jerry's in the room as well. And by the time this podcast comes out, we already would have been to Torquay to go and see Hannah's niece, who's, I think she's 18. Oh, um, she loved her. Yeah, yeah. I gave her the teddy bear. <laughs> oh. I gave her the teddy bear that when Hannah was originally in the hospital and, and she was staying in the house with my parents and she didn't hear any of this, but in the morning I, we had to tell her and we went to Marks and Spencer's and I said, let's buy something for Hannah and she pulled out the teddy bear. So giving her that and giving her, I think we gave her some of Hannah's artwork quilts, but to go and see her and to think, well, how could I be more intentional about this? Mm -hmm. And Hannah also has two um, goddaughters, uh, Scarlett and Beau, that I can be more intentional with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is what this whole thing is yes. giving me is the opportunity to be much more intentional. What, what, I love that word. What, yeah. what does that word mean to you, being intentional? Oh, to live with intention, to live with intent. I think um, the word priorities comes up as you say that, to be really on purpose Yeah. and know your priorities. And it's so interesting that you're going through that journey as well and that's what you're bringing forward today because... That's a lot of the work that I've been doing recently, personally. I went away to Turkey a, a few weeks ago and spent that four or five days really journaling and being so intentional. These are, you know, these are my priorities. This is what I'm living for. But also this is what comes first now. You know, having that kind of game plan for the next um, few months and then and then moving forward. What do you mean? So where where is your... Your focus of attention. So I guess looking like professionally, like looking at things like value systems, like I said, family for me is massive. And if, if you think about wanting, you know, a heart's desire to want to create my own family, that takes time. In touch. It's not about the child. It's about who you do it with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that takes time of asking yourselves different questions when it comes to relating to others, when it comes to dating, to be looking at somebody thinking, could that be the father of my child in a life partner? forever if not for a really long season of time is very different and takes contemplation and and intention and um maybe different behaviors I know a lot of women in my life who are super successful in business in that area and they're in their mid-40s and they don't have partners and they don't have families that's often wisdom that they've passed down to me they're like yeah. give this intention because they often feel like part of their time has maybe passed you know not to say they couldn't have children but yeah it's gonna be harder so that kind of thing yeah I, i'm really fascinated obviously the podcast was called my 365 then it was called pete cohen then it was called future self and now we've gone <laughs> back, back to my 365, my 365. and that. actually you've seen the whole yeah rise of my 365 you were you were in the same house where that whole thing started yeah about my intention my identity what's important where am what am i leaning into and i just love the way you lean into what's difficult and and challenging do you go on you're gonna... i was gonna say actually so i was gonna say watching you in that time was hugely inspirational you were up at 5 a.m every day and watching you birth that um and seeing where it is now and hearing that journey well done yeah like it's amazing and yeah. why have you changed i'm curious why has it changed identities um, well, you mean as in the names yeah and... i think sometimes the only way you work out that something works is to just experiment and totally but it's funny because i used to draw every day a mountain and me at the bottom and like little dots that represent incremental because I and the my also stands for incremental my imagination mm -hmm. and see this mountain and climbing up the mountain um I just didn't realize the importance of of that and I had to leave it to then come back to it to to realize mm -hmm. that that's where it's at for me life is about an intentional life Mm -hmm. and, and there's levels mean to you i'm sorry what does intention mean to you oh it's a good question it means working out what's important yeah and then going deep yeah with that and now it means again this is this is so deep hannah was someone who would do stuff and then let it go and let it happen for me in the past it was Go, keep going, don't stop. Yeah. And now I realise to be intentional is to be in the moment, to do something and let it let it let it nurture. Great. We are a part of nature. Let it happen. 
So be more intuitive, another I. Yeah. Be more imaginative. Just have faith. Mm. And it's already starting to happen. Because this has made me stop to a point where I don't have to live the way I was living before. And I kind of wish I'd lived in a different way before when she was here because she would have got the, the better of me. And now I realise, well, I can't do anything about that now, but I can do something about... So how do you wish you'd live differently? Um, well, she got to see parts of me that no one else did. Mm. And why should she have got that part of me, the tired, burnt out me? Mm. She deserved more. But, you know, at least I could be that way with her. Mm. I think the biggest wake-up calls were when, obviously, you know, when, when she first got sick 13 years ago, I, that was not the woman I was going to marry. Mm. I didn't think... In fact, I was talking to my friend in America about this, Dr. Ray, that we met in Croatia... And if there hadn't been that ash cloud in Iceland, the, the world stopped, yeah. I would have gone home. And I, I never would have spent time with Hannah. There was a big stop. It was the first of the stops. That was a stop where we came together. And then the following stop was a year later when she was, you know, had this massive seizure, a big stop. But it, there was a lot of fear. And then obviously we did something about that. There's been lots of stops along the way, but it's the stops that have been the time where I've stopped to appreciate Mm -hmm. And when she got diagnosed last year, um, I really stopped and I really changed my ways. I stopped doing lots of the work I was doing and I was just with her for the first time properly with her, mm -hmm. you know, like doing everything I could for her and just being there for her. Mm -hmm. And then obviously a lot last year, but again, when she got uh, really sick again, Again, it was the stop and right, everything, nothing else, ma all that matters is just being there for her. And I'm proud of myself for the mm. way I did it, but it's, I suppose, a bit sad that sometimes I've had to wait for really horrible things to happen to really appreciate what I do have. Mm. And I suppose that's also one of the biggest shifts now is I'm much more appreciative of where I am and what I have. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what I think you... the word that comes through is, is being present as well. Yeah. Like, it's just when you're operating at that fast pace and when you have to take something to happen to make you stop, are you really present? No. Are you really in the... Are you really taking yeah, it no. all in? And what does it feel like to live like that? It's very different. Oh, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's not actually that... And I, I've reflected on this. I had so much fear attached to losing my parents from a young age that I was, wasn't particularly present with them because yeah. I was always worried about them dying and now they're not here. Yeah. So yeah. it's... And I think it's also like, it's how you show up in the hard times too because the thing is, both all, all the energies and all the states are valid. It's great at times to be full throttle, go, go, go. It's not bad. Yeah. It, you often reflect, and I've often reflected in times that, oh, you know, I have. Like, if I'm really... We should spend more time with her. You know, my younger sister would call my Hannah a best friend. Like, I didn't have the, the time bonds that they had. You know, they had calls every day. They had... You know, they'd spend all their time together. We didn't... They lived together for a season. Myself and Hannah didn't have that. But I've come to great peace with that because what I know is that at that time I was choosing what was my highest expression. And whilst in retrospect, mm. I am sad, in the moment, she wanted me to do that because she was like, that's you, Sarah. Go do you. Yeah. And it was in those last moments, I remember, like the last you know, 10 months, I was there constantly. Yeah. I was there all the time. I was there when my younger sister was in China because she was teaching in China. I was the one that was there. Yeah. I showed up in, and I know I showed up in a way that was admirable and respected in my family and yeah, they knew did. who I was. And so everything's got a season too. You know, <laughs> mm, you, did, you did. I did, and also yeah, Jer you did. Jerry, yeah, Jerry, Jerry did. did. You totally. And I literally, whenever I think of you and Hannah, I'm like, what a man, and what a woman, and what a relationship, and what love, and what you did for her, and 
it, it's who you are. Yeah. You wouldn't have I love what you said way. there about your highest expression. Yeah. That is deeply profound because it's like, I'm like you. My my highest expressions can often be in front of people presenting, yeah. all of that stuff, coaching, um, being in front of a camera. But that's not the only expression. And I no. can express myself in so many other ways. And that's what this is also teaching me to do. Mm to express myself in any way I want. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just touch on a couple more things. So talk to me about River. So mm -hmm. River was born, um, I mean, that must have been just so difficult. So River yeah. is your nephew. Yes. How old is he now? Nine months. Nine months. Ten. Wow, nearly 10 months. Yes, his birthday is going to be 17th of September. So, and so he was born under pretty traumatic circumstances yeah. because... Um, your sister was going through chemotherapy and yeah so she started um she had three rounds of chemo before she gave birth she gave birth and was actually in really good strength and then she could breastfeed for a little bit and I remember her saying that she makes me really emotional I remember her saying to him like breastfeeding you was the best thing I've ever done in my life yeah, Say that again. She said Rest to River, she's like, breastfeeding yeah, yeah, is the but best that's thing amazing. ever to do in my life. That's probably really important yeah. from an energetic point of view for that he had that experience. Oh, yeah, it was three weeks and it was, you know, amazing. And she said as she knew, as she could feel her body shutting down and she just did, you know, she did round after round after chemo and radio. And when she knew at the end, she said, if my whole life's purpose was to give birth to River, then I've... I've fulfilled, done it. Yeah. I fulfilled it and yeah. um it was really hard to watch because she was fighting from my perception and what she expressed she was fighting falling in love with him yeah because she knew she was going and so for mother, mother to have to do that you know uh, it's just oh, horrendous I mean just horrendous, thinking yeah. about that again just yeah it makes me think about okay this is difficult for me but yeah. how difficult must that be? I mean, it's like, try and quantify that. Yeah. I mean, it just yeah puts everything into a completely different perspective, right? Of like, oh Yeah. But what, what impact has that had on you in terms of showing up as the auntie? Yeah, so... <laughs> I, um, I wish you were my auntie <laughs> I think you'd be the best I auntie. think I'm going to be the crazy auntie yeah. Um, yeah it's what type of an auntie are you I go and see River on a practical level I see him once if not twice a week at the moment you know the beginning after losing my sister it was a lot and my intention is to always see him you know once a week um, and him know who I wow. am and I like doing the fun things with him so he's a very active little boy so he's already doing gym class and he's already doing swimming lessons so I love taking him to do that love playing with him it's made me see my own selfishness so much you know I just think about my brother-in-law and you know him being with River all the time and with his main carer and he's just started to go back to work and I'm like wow yeah. You know, it makes you see you a lot and you're like, could I do what he does? Um, and he, River's been brought up by us all. So it's yeah. a complete family, community upbringing. It really is a tribal upbringing. Um, my mum's there like every other day. My sister is when she's here, you know. I, I, I see the parents. future and I see the massive impact yeah. that you've had on this young baby as he becomes a boy and a man. Yeah. That, you know, you bec you take on that, mothering when I say mother it's the mothering energy of it's so it's so interesting because I'm very definite on it not being the mother yeah and it's like he will know his mother yeah yeah and he already's been shown his mother and you know we really want to tell the yeah. stories but one of my dear friends she said it beautifully she said you are the gatekeepers or the key keepers to your sister's younger years yeah that's you and your sister yeah that you'll be able to impart yeah. that and really share that because we have an insight that 
my brother-in-law doesn't have, my mum doesn't have. It's like, we've got those secrets. Yeah. And we're the ones who get to share those. So mm. it's time. It's just being with the person. It's not, you don't have to make a song and dance out of everything. It's just, let me show up in your life consistent, consistently. Yeah. It's about consistency and intention. Consi- inten- intentionally <laughs> consistent. consistent. Yeah. So um, there was one more thing. Sorry. That's all right. Don't worry. We don't need you in here. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to do, ask you about about Jerry. So you've obviously met Jerry a few times, right? Yes. What do you think about Jerry? I adore Jerry. Jerry, by the way, for those of you that don't know, Jerry is Hannah's dad. Oh, what to say about Jerry? Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. So you, you asked me about that event. In, I, did, yeah. Did you not know what happened? I saw it. Oh, you should, yeah, so you saw yeah. me unfinished business. I did. So for those of us that don't know, Sarah and I were at an event in Vegas where Hannah's mum had just passed. Do you know the story of this? I do. So Hannah's mum had just passed away and we were going to Vegas and we almost didn't go because Hannah was like, well, my mum's just passed away. So we spoke to Jerry and Jerry said, Look, you need to go. And in fact, I had to go to Greece. It was a crazy story, but Hannah ended up going and I saw her the next day. And we were asked to speak on stage. And I, there were, what, 20,000? There was a lot of people Lots there. Of people. And my plan was to get everyone to stop and go, Jerry, Jerry, <laughs> for Jerry. But, um, we ran out of time. And, and That's were, Jerry Springer, by the way. Yeah, Jerry Springer. Know. And um, it couldn't happen. But I was so glad that I, at this event in Vegas, uh, a few weeks ago, I got everyone to stop and say... Yes. Um, I mean, Jerry is just a rock and one of the most beautiful humans. I think every single time I've messaged you, Jerry, in this past couple of, you know, months, and I've just said, how are you? And he said, you know, I'm not good. Or, you're always real. And then he said, but more importantly, how are you? Thank you for showing up. Um, I can't imagine what it feels like for you, Jerry, to be where you are. But the way you spoke at Hannah's celebration of life... Yeah, it was pretty amazing. was one of the most immense things I've ever heard. You were wonderful. <laughs> we you can were hear wonderful. Laughing. Yeah, yeah. He's actually amazed me. Yeah. Honestly, I've, in my whole life I've seen some incredible things, but seeing him just like leaning into this horrible season... I mean, yeah. literally just leaning in after having nursed Tanner's mum for 11 years with dementia. And, and then you think, but I, I'm not sh- I'm sure when he hears about your sister and River, he said, that's just on, a, for me, I just say, well, that's on another level, yeah. another level of, but then the level of, okay. I mean, what, do you believe, this is what a friend of mine said, you said the universe only throws stuff at you that you can handle. Yes. Even though you'd feel that you can't handle it. But the, yeah, the it's truth such, is, it's if such you, a clear cliche isn't but it? Is it? But it, it's like cliches are kind of true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I, I I didn't think I could handle yeah. this, but I have found a way to handle it. So do you think the universe has thrown this at you? And is your life is it it's a wrong thing to say, but is your life better? Better. Because of this? Or is it more empowered or is it in, is it enriched? Is it enhanced? Yes. And it's it's always what you make of anything. So I love it's something I've often come back to. It's it's actually from the Bible, and it says beauty from ashes. Yeah. And there's a whole verse around beauty from ashes, and it's like, isn't that the phoenix life? The phoenix, well, the yes, phoenix, the phoenix, which is the name of your business, company, right? Yeah. So, so the phoenix yeah. that rises from the ashes. Exactly. And can you create? Can you be part of cultivating with the universe or with nature or with everything that comes? Cultivating the beauty from destruction and ashes and. Um, you know, I, I think in this time as well, it was always turning my eyes. You, know, you talk about me, but then I remember, like, I found solace in the most strangest places at times. I read this book or listened to this lecture, and it was this historian who'd written a book called Death of a Soldier Told by His Sister. And she was talking about the Ukrainian war and lose and grief and history and losing her brother in war and battle. And you're like, all around us, there's grief. There's loss, there's death. And actually fixing my eyes and listening to these stories and experiences of others and their movements through it, their rawness through it, it's like taking yourself out of your own grief too. Not not to ignore yeah, yeah. that, but to really connect. It's been, 
hugely cathartic and I think we see it's all one yeah. like pain and and praise are one celebration loss and, and, loss gain. and gain are one yeah it's all part of the same but I suppose if you don't see it that way and you see loss just as loss you'll stay lost yeah yeah nothing is separate in my yeah it, yeah Without getting too <laughs> mythical, yeah. Too metaphysical. Meta, I don't know me, what the me, word would be there, yeah. But I think, Meth- I think one of the things I, I'm a huge fan of is people finding their own way. I yeah. don't want to tell... I know some people believe there is a way and this is the way, but I, I think one of the beauties of this world is to find your own way through what you go through. Yeah. But I have learned so much the power of who you surround yourself with oh my god yes thank you Mm -hmm. i think i I was on a podcast earlier this week actually and that's exactly what i said i said at every stage of everything i was talking about a traumatic experience i had when i was young when i had an eating disorder and i said it was who was around me at that time that stopped me from having to be admitted into hospital with my parents it's always been who's around you yeah always who's around you so really so my raphael Oh, I just gave you a, a crystal mm-hmm. today, f- even though he's not been here for 10 years. I got some crystals from his wife, who I went to go and say thank you to in, in Dallas. He said to me years ago, I mean, I worked with him for 16 years of my life. There's a picture of him there, look. Mm. And he was um, he was someone who saved, he saved Anna's life. You know, he mm. was the one that said, find people that are still alive, mm-hmm. find out why. He was the one who said, ask him what she's going to do when she gets better. Yeah. I mean, what do you mean? What are you talking about? She's been given 18 months. He went, so what? People defy the odds all the time. He told me years ago, he said, you need a support group of people around you. And I realised, looking back, that I struggled to find those people because I just wasn't in the space to attract those types of people who were capable of supporting me and I could support them. Mm -hmm. And I see who I've become through the work I've chosen to do myself that... I have those people around me mm-hmm. and it's made going through this season a lot easier yeah. and just feel so grateful. Like people ask me, how do you feel? To start off with, I felt, I don't know. Then it was shit. Then it was like kind of okay. Now I feel so, yeah. so grateful. Do you know what? I love what you've shared there. And again, to come back to intention, I remember one of my mentors and guides in September we sat down and we had a whole day together a whole strategy day together and I was literally pen to paper all day like as he was talking and one of the things he said to me was exactly that like your tribe define out 10 people I think it was 10 he said women and men um but I mean it could be any number and have an intentional conversation with them yeah you know and so I went away that day and I caught I caught, wrote my list and it was part of a wider life plan and I said, I called all these people and I said, you're my tribe, you're my people. And so what that, and I just want to call it out. And I know you know this, but I just want to let you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm here for you and we're in, yeah? We're in, <laughs> we're in. And then six months later, yeah. look, yeah. I needed that tribe. But it was because of, you know, like you said, like sometimes you need to, to think, like not think about these things before they happen, but don't let days pass without saying things yeah, to the people I, I've, that you I've been much more intentional yeah. about telling people that I'm so grateful yeah and you know as I reflect I just also just want to thank you for the way you supported me honestly mm-hmm. just like sending me messages and, and reaching out to me when you're obviously going through this difficult season um, I just really appreciate it and I appreciate exactly the same thing it was it was two way and I think also, as you say that, I'm thinking, because you were supported, you could support me. Because I was supported, I yeah, could support. Yeah. We're all, if we can support someone else, it's what that allows them to be and do for another as well. Like I think the thing I find really fascinating about that is, who do you need to be in order to support people? Or who right. could you be? You know, what? Because I'm, I'm interested in serving the servers. That's my my life's work is about, if you're serving someone... And, and that service is to help that person in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter what it is, product, service. I want to help you service those people on a higher level. Who do I need to yeah. be in order to service you in the best way that I can? And that's what another thing I just love about you is that you do service yourself. You look after yes. yourself. You, 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 you stop every day to create your day. And seeing the person that you've become and seeing how you 
are dealing with what's been going on and the way you leaned into this. I'll never forget you for, I'll never forget you anyway. Yeah. But I'll never forget how you leaned into this season of, if that wasn't hard enough, one of your great friends also is dying and you still leaned in, like, come on, bring it on. Yeah. Pat Jerry talks about the 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 film, um, what's it called? Forrest Gump, where there's the sailor going, is that all you've got with the waves? <laughs> is that, you know, give it, you know, yeah. give me something else because this is nothing. <laughs> and it was, you know, and I will say, I can remember sitting there on that day in the hospice with Hannah and I was like, oh, fuck. Fuck. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was sat there and I was like, this is not. This is not kosher. <laughs> but it wasn't until I got there that I felt that. And I was sat there and I was like... Yeah, I was... In this surreal situation, from the same way of them passing, yeah. in the same beds, in the, the same... Na- you know, everything. Same name. The same name. So even, what did you do? Even the same middle name. Yeah, yeah. Both got Elizabeth. Hannah and Elizabeth. It was... Um, yeah. So how did you deal with that? I just bead with it. Bead with it. <laughs> yeah. I just bead with it. I'm bead like, with it. I'm here now. Yeah. I've got to bead with this. Yeah, you, I might actually call this podcast How bead, to Bead how with to It. How to Bead With It. No, I think I'm going to call it what, what, about the stance, the hearts, the, that, what did you say? The, uh, about the, the heart's position. The, the stance, I think. The, the, I'll, I'll go yeah, back and listen to it. it. Yeah. But uh, look, just two more things, right? First off, Tell us just a little bit about what you do because we haven't. People, some people don't know. Yeah. Um, how long we got? <laughs> what do you do? What, what, so you've got businesses. I'm, I'm, you've yeah. got a podcast. What's your podcast called? So my podcast is called Fireside Whispers. So what it's can people go and do with nice. that? Go and listen to it. Yeah, listen to like it. Like it, comment it, it, share it, subscribe, download it, share it with people. It's incredible. I've, I love it. It. We are interviewing. Uh, entrepreneurial women culture shifters it's all women and they are from such diverse walks of life and it's their life story I think men should listen to this I agree because I think well there's so many reasons but one of the best things you can ever do is listen yeah and you can learn a lot I mean there's so much about business and the way business is run by men for men and this Mm -hmm. sexist crazy world that we're in we do touch on that yeah I listened to an episode yesterday actually that's being released in July I went into a police officer and we go into like you know if you're in the UK the Casey report and violence against women and all her experiences in that and and yet it's heartfelt and it's her life and she's real and she talks about grief and her loss and yeah, so I love that. It's a real passion project. My a lot of my life's work is is with women. So I coach yeah. women. I provide in my business. We provide flexible work opportunities to women, um, and I am really building out. And in the formation stages, of building out this this Fireside Whispers community, and what that's going to look like with events and workshops and masterminds and. Yes. So if people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? You can follow me on Instagram at sarah.moxum, that's M-O-X-O-M, or Fireside Whispers, and also subscribe at firesidewhispers.com. We'll put all the links in this. Yeah, Yeah, because I told you how big we are in In countries like Uganda, Uganda, Ghana. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. And I've never really even promoted this podcast, but it's seven years old. And you have actually been a guest... uh, before a I few have, years ago, I forgot about that. Yeah, so people could go back and listen. But it's funny, I suppose, if they went back and listened to that, yeah, like, is that the same would, person? That, <laughs> yeah, because are you? I heard someone say, I think it was Ernest Hemingway say, "True nobility is when you uh, being superior to your former self." You look mm. back and go, "I can't believe that was me." Wow, I think you've embraced every part of your journey, haven't you, and who you are, and also with wisdom, you know, be careful with what you put online. Too. Yeah. Yeah, we had a conversation we did about have a conversation that before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I would encourage people to go and check Sarah out. And um, thank you so much for thank coming you. down today. And I gave you a present, a couple of presents. You, you gave me some chocolates, booja booja. Booja booja. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, guys. Feel free to let us know what your biggest takeaway uh, from this. Uh, podcast today it's been very cathartic for massively cathartic probably been the most cathartic Mm -hmm. podcast i've ever done actually the second most cathartic (laughs) (laughs) it was what i did recently that was also just hugely like my god i can't believe what's happening to me as i'm talking Mm. to someone else so thank you so much thank you for having me on pete i really appreciate it and this has been cathartic for me as well and 
real and we're talking real stuff. So yeah, thank you. The greater things that are stuck inside my head.